So next up, I am joined by Maisha Begum, who is from uh, the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. We're on the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse, and we're going to be discussing that event and how the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective is commemorating it. But before we get into any of that, I just want to give a, a massive welcome to Maisha. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thanks so much for having us. No, I'm really grateful for this platform for what we're doing and what we have planned so thanks again for like letting us come on not at all thank you so much for joining us so let's get started then so it's been 10 years now since the rhino plaza disaster could you explain to our viewers uh, who might not be familiar with it uh, what happened at rhino plaza um for those of our viewers who aren't aware yeah sure so for context rhino plaza was an eight-story building in bangladesh which housed multiple businesses, so shops, a bank, um, but particularly garment factories. Um, and so in April 2013, it became widely known among the public locally and nearby and the workers inside that there were wide cracks in the building and it basically sparked fear among the workers. Um, when the cracks became very visible, a lot of the, the businesses inside shut down, so the shops and the banks, they closed for business. However, the only businesses that remained open were the garment factories and they basically continued business as usual. And so on the morning of 24 April 2013, garment workers refused to go in the factory, literally pleading to the factory owners to not let them in because they were very scared for their lives. Instead, they were met with um, threats that they would lose their wages. And bear in mind, garment workers are paid poverty wages. They don't have any savings. So they were essentially compelled to go into work that day. And literally hours later, the whole building collapsed within 90 seconds and there were 3,000 workers, in, workers inside. And so this, for, this basically marked the most deadliest disaster in the garment industry, and the official death toll is 1,138 and thousands injured. But according to Bangladesh Garment Worker Solidarity Group, which is an workers' organization in Bangladesh, they estimate it's actually 1,175. And so a lot of the investigations and so a lot of trade unions had to go on the ground and basically a lot of brands were denying that they were sourcing from the factories. And so trade unions had to take it upon themselves to go into the rubble amidst the bodies and the, um, the just the dis just the, it was a really horrible situation. Um, it was just really horrible. They basically had to go in and look for the labels, try and find which brands were linked to the factories. And so for UK brands, a lot of the brands were Matalan, Benetton, Primark, Mango. Um, and so, yeah, this was the collapse was largely the result of the fact that the owner had been adding extra stories onto the building that we, but he had had no permit for that. And it was basically a very structurally unsafe building. Um, and so it, the building basically couldn't hold the weight of all the machinery in the factory, sort of um, the vibrations from the factories. And so for us, this was... Um, yeah so for me I was 18 at the time and so for most of us it was just basically a harrowing reminder of how deadly the fashion industry is and how workers are essentially just cogs in a machine that are very dehumanized they're subject to horrific working conditions and they're just made to work regardless of the risk to their lives and the fact that brands will continuously try to undercut their wages their health and safety um, just to maximize their profits and so You've talked obviously there about what happened uh, in the event. I guess following the building collapse, there was, um, I mean, it exposed sort of major issues within the garment industry and the, and I guess in the supply chains of major Western brands, um, some of which you've mentioned. But after the building collapse, there was a real push um, amongst the, I guess, uh, the labor movement in Bangladesh and in the international solidarity movement for the industry to, to clean up its act. And uh, that included through, for example, the Bangladesh Fire Safety Accord and other measures. Um, what do you think the impact has been of the, the campaigning around Rana Plaza? And um, what's your sense of the uh, scale of the issues in the garment industry today? Are these issues still present? Yeah, so with the Bangladesh Accord, this was so this is a legally binding agreement which holds brands legally accountable to invest in health and safety in the factories in Bangladesh that they source from. And so this was actually an agreement that was the trade unions were trying to push this agreement prior to Rana Plaza, but a lot of the brands were kind of just like, no, we don't want to get involved and kind of shifting responsibility, evading responsibility. And then when Tazreen factory fire happened in 2012, which was literally six months before 
um, Rana Plaza, then that happened. And so they were like, oh, maybe we should be investing in health and safety. And then Rana Plaza happened. And then because of the global outcry, like you mentioned, that then led to that agreement being pushed ahead. So it was something that was in the works, but it was just, it took thousands of people to die and a global campaign for it to happen. And so, yeah, this got put through um, and it's basically, yeah, a legally binding agreement with, between global and Bangladeshi unions and brands. And so we have seen, so a lot of research has shown that there has been significant in, um, success in terms of protecting health and safety. And so, for example, there was a study by Professor Mark Anna, who found who compared um, health and safety between 2013 and 2018 and found for example, 83% of factories that were identified as having inadequate circuit breakers, which can basically the big, big fire hazard, um, they had been fully remediated by 2018. And then um, also when it comes to escapable exits, which is a big issue with a lot of, particularly in factory fires, 97% of the factories with these issues had been remediated. So we're seeing a lot of remediation in the factories under the accord. I think a significant problem we're finding is that there's a lot of subcontracted factories, which are basically factories that are hired by bigger tier one factories to help meet the demands of the excessive demands of brands um, sort of production requirements. And so these are very much under the radar. No one knows they exist. No one really, there's no sort of regulation. And so workers are very much at risk of health and safety violations, abuse, um, wage theft, et cetera. And so this is a ongoing sort of systemic sort of issue among across the garment industry. And I basically today took a quick look at any sort of fire help fires that are um, industrial accidents that have happened in the garment factory because I do media monitoring my day job. So it's something I've checked regularly. And literally in the past two weeks, we've had a like three shoe fire factories, a textile factory fire. Um, and one another one in which um, four people had to be rescued from the fire. So this is a very, this is literally in the just past two weeks. So this is an ongoing issue beyond the Bangladesh Accord. And I think another point I want to make is that health and safety shouldn't necessarily be confined to structural issues. So for example, we have wage theft, which is, at, which is basically putting workers at risk because they can barely afford to kind of nourish themselves and afford to pay rent, etc the systemic uh, gender-based violence and harassment that we've seen continuously and particularly exacerbated post-COVID. Um, and then we have mental health impact of um, having to work forced, or having to work overtime to just make ends meet. And so there's all these elements of health and safety that are still very much there and exist and have been exacerbated by brands purchasing practices, which is basically how they choose to do business with their suppliers. And so a lot of the time, they'll undercut the supplies and say, we're not going to pay this. We're not going to, we're going to ask for this amount of um, clothing, but we're not going to pay the amount you need. And if you don't agree, we're going to go somewhere else. So you have to accept this. And that has been an ongoing basis. And this, the report I mentioned earlier by Mark Anna found that while health and safety has improved, these practices have become worse. So the expectation of the lead times that factories are given to make clothes has become shorter. The wages have gone lower. So we're seeing this improvement in health and safety and um, it's a really great thing. And it's now been expanded to Pakistan with the Pakistan Accord, which is amazing, but we're seeing all these other issues related to health and safety that are still very much existent. And amid the econ economic crisis, where, um, brands have once again put workers, um, like basically sacrificed workers and are now again putting workers at risk and it's just getting worse. And so I guess in light of that, then, like the kind of endemic issues that you've talked about there within the garment industry, I mean, that's that's also true within other sectors as well. So you look at the electronic sector, that's a huge, has huge issues around labour rights violations, around chemical exposure, all the things that you talked yeah. about as well. In light of all that and the kind of ongoing issues within global supply chains, how can people support the struggle of workers on the ground who are uh, in factories experiencing these conditions? How can people uh, support and stand in solidarity with those people? Yeah, I mean, while all these horrific things are happening, there's a massive sort of worker-led trade union movement across the garment sector. And I think one thing we found is that effective collective solidarity has been very key to challenging brands' purchasing practices. So for example, during the pandemic, people might remember when brands basically in response to their, their shop shutting, they basically canceled orders of the suppliers. Their first people to go to were to undercut the, work, the workers. And so this meant that a lot of suppliers couldn't afford to pay the workers, workers lost their wages. 
um, and there were like mass demonstrations, mass protests. And so unions basically connected with international worker organizations and said, look, these are the brands that are canceling orders with us. A lot of suppliers provide that intel as well. And so there was essentially a global sort of movement, especially as it was locked down, everyone was online. There was a very much a big outcry against the brands canceling orders without any sort of regulation of the workers and conditions. And there was a report by Worker Rights Consortium, which found about 80% of workers were essentially starving because of it. And it was a really horrific time, but because of that movement, a lot of brands then U-turned and agreed to pay the council for the council orders, which was a huge sort of, we're, we're, you're convincing billion dollar brands to basically U-turn on a big business decision they've made. And so since then, we've seen a big sort of, sort of collective action sort of thing that's been happening since. So whenever there's a factory closure, there's a bright organization called Clean Clothes Campaign or Labour Behind the Label, they'll basically say, look, this is happening. This is what our trade unions are telling us. Here's how to get on board with the campaign. And so there's been outcry, subsequent outcry, and as a result, we've helped to sort of U-turn those decisions or force brands to pay up. This isn't a very like, this isn't a sustainable way to do it, but it's effective. And I think more supporting worker unions and worker movement and build, union building will only strengthen the movement. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think it's a very bottom up solution we have where it's very much workers are leading the movement and we are supporting that in any way we can. So yeah, organizations such as People's Campaign, Labour Behind the Label, War on Want, they're very much sort of, in contact with these unions and so i guess uh before i ask you about the kind of uh, commemoration events that uh, the runner plaza solidarity collective has planned i just you mentioned there that um the kind of responsive campaigns isn't a sustainable way to tackle the systemic issues so i guess what do you think needs to happen in terms of long-term reform to supply chains in order to tackle these systemic issues yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the trade union movement across the garment sector has been weakened significantly. And I think I think while I say it's not sustainable, I think it's it's going to eventually hopefully lead to a stronger trade union movement. And I think that's I'm pushing, I don't know, it's a bit difficult because I think essentially we would just need brands to that the redistribution of wealth. I think brand we're very much not at that stage yet. But I do think building the trade union movement, because essentially that's what will lead to significant change in the ability to collective bargain um, and leave put workers on the table. So I think I think continuing to support these movements is absolutely crucial. And I think eventually that will lead to a place where workers will then be able to speak up and have their say in how their conditions are. So finally then uh, it's the tenth anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster. Um, what does the Solidarity Collective have planned to commemorate uh, the event? Yeah, so we have multiple events happening across London, Leicester and Manchester for everyone to get involved in the public to help not only commemorate the workers and to pay tribute to them as well as all other workers who have become a victim of, um, who have basically uh, been subjected to such horrific conditions, but also to remind ourselves of who those who profited and continue to profit from the exploitation of workers. So. On the 23rd, there are marches taking place in both London and Manchester to pay tribute to the workers and also remind brands who are on a high street of their role and that we haven't forgotten their complicity. On the 24th, there's memorial events happening both in London, in Al Tabeli Park, and also in Leicester with high fields. Um, high, Leicester is a big sort of garment hub, is a hub for garment factories. So um, there'll be a bunch of events from panels, um, exhibitions, film screenings, and a memorial service. So you can find out all this information at ranaplaza-solidarity.org and we'll keep updating for any events that are happening. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time today, Marisha. It's been an absolute pleasure. No worries. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.